When it comes to um, consistency and achievement and accomplishment, I would say Edwin ranks number one. There will never be another one like him. Edwin, to me, has been and always will be uh, probably the most prominent sports figure in USA track and field. He was a very fluent runner. Uh, it looked effortless. He was strong. He's, uh, he had the ability. He had the foot stride, uh, the capability. I mean, he was, he was awesome. I do think that for Edwin, it was a little bit manly against boys. I think he was ahead of his time. He was the best in the world. He was, he was peerless. But you could tell that he was on another stratosphere. I guess over the years in which when Edwin ran, he dominated the event for such a long time. It was kind of like, well, whoever's in the race with him, they're running for second place. It's huge, a huge impact. I mean, Edwin was the beginning and the end of 400 hurdles for a decade. The 400 meter hurdles, or intermediate hurdles, is often called the man-killer event. It requires more discipline, more tactical awareness, and more physical endurance than any other sprint event. The hurdles are spaced out every 35 meters, and anything can happen in those 35 meters. A 400 meter hurdler has got to equate the number of strides to the level of fatigue that they're in. So you need rhythm, spatial awareness, um, and a special kind of, of commitment to stick, stick to the plan. You have to have, in my opinion, the strength of a half miler. You have to have that in kind of endurance. You have to have the speed of a 400 meter runner, and you have to have the, fle the flexibility of a short hurdler. So all those things combined uh, go into making a good 400 hurdler. One man combined these attributes better than any other athlete in the history of the intermediate hurdles. For almost a decade, Edwin Moses reigned supreme. For almost a decade, he never lost a race. Nine years, nine months, and nine days, I went undefeated. And uh, it was a day by day and a year by year uh, scene. I mean, I love the symmetry of, of, of life. Nine years, nine months, nine days, undefeated. Took on all comers. Come and have a go if you think you're good enough. None were. It's a phenomenal testimony to a great man. To have 10 years unbeaten in any sport is, I think, pretty unique. You don't win 122 races over 10 years by happenstance. You have to have something uh, special. And he had it. Um, he had the right physique. He had the right time in history. He had the attitude. He had the wherewithal. And he had the heart. Tall, languid, elegant, Moses' style was unmistakable. Born in Dayton, Ohio in 1955, the greatest hurdler in history was initially more focused on school than sport. I tried a lot of different sports like every other kid, and uh, I was never earmarked to, to be a great athlete because I was always one of the smaller kids at the time. In 1973, he received an academic scholarship to move to Atlanta where he studied physics at Morehouse College. But it wasn't long before the science student found his true calling. Track and field is an event where you have to continually climb to the top, and no matter what age group or, or level you're at, if you're uh, running track in high school, you start out at the bottom of the heap, and you have to perform your way to the top. And then when you get to the top of that level, you find out there's a whole different level of other people, and you have to start back down at the bottom. So. Uh, you're constantly going up and going down, and uh, for those of us who become world-class athletes, eventually we get to the point where we can handle, you know, the top players out there. And, you know, it took me from the age of 11 until, you know, 20 years old before I got there. Moses only began running the 400 hurdles in 1975, yet he created an instant stir as the 1976 Olympics drew closer. As we were going along and during the season, I started to hear about this kid from back east dropping times, and we were like, who is this kid? And it's like his name was Edwin Moses. And then all of a sudden, 
Edmund wasn't considered the dark horse anymore. Uh, Edmund was one of the kind of people you had to worry about trying to, to beat. Once he got through that Olympic trials going into 76, and I saw him, I just got, there's no way that this kid could maintain that. But Moses was able to maintain his form. With his trademark glasses and graceful running style, he became one of the stars at Montreal. That one was almost like the nutty professor, wearing those glasses, had his little beads around his neck and everything. And you just look at him and go like, I can't believe this kid has this much potential. That potential was realized in the Olympic final. I was confident that I was trained better than everybody. I knew that I could win the race. And uh, during the Olympic Games, uh, fortunately for me, I didn't really get caught up in being at the Olympics. I was so seriously into the competition. I went out and did what I needed to do. Moses led from the front, finishing way ahead of second place to Mike Shine. He won his first Olympic gold medal, and he also set a new world record. A star was born. Here's this kid, you know, 21 year old kid come out of Morehouse, you know, and runs 47 and change and sets a world record. It, it blows everybody's mind. He was just unbeatable, just unbeatable at that time. Ed Moses' rise was no accident. The self coached science student made his sport into a science itself. The formula was simple to cover the 400 meters in fewer strides than anyone else. To take 13 steps, uh, is approximately nine feet and nine inches for each stride and there's about there's a lot of intermediate hurdlers that can take it for maybe five or six hurdles but uh, once you go into the second turn then it really gets difficult to keep your stride to that length and so far i'm the only one who's consistently maintained 13. edwin's 13 steps i think was born out of just his physical makeup he's about six three six three and a half you know, 170 pounds with an eight-foot stride. You vet that out, and it comes out to a 13-step pattern through 10 hurdles. Edwin was able to do 13s with ease right to hurdle 10. So that's where he would get his difference. Um, in the first five hurdles, all things being equal, we could all have the same stride pattern. Bang, 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 bang. Run tall, bang, 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 bosh. No worries. Uh, it's then in the, in the change down. And there was, of course, where his advantage was, you know, the second turn and coming home, where he can maintain his stride and maintain the flow and the rhythm, where we, most of the rest of us had to change strides. He was calculating, and he was consistent. And one thing Edwin figured out very early on um, within his race was, if I go out and do 13 strides each and every time, I'm gonna win the race, because no one else was doing it. Moses wrote the commandments, if you gotta run 13 or better. It worked for me, you know, the, the next guy in the next line could run 13 steps and it wouldn't be effective for him. So it's all a matter of, you know, how you train, your body type, um, whether or not you're gonna run faster using 13 steps or 14, but for me, it worked. It worked so well that Moses kept on winning, race after race, year after year, Nobody got close. Well, I guess there are maybe three Americans, and there's an East German and a West German that are the top competitors right now. But uh, I guess if they were all put in the race, then you, it would be nowhere telling who was going to win. Mm -hmm. So actually, I'm still out by myself. In the run-up to the 1980 Olympic Games, Moses had proved himself peerless in his event. But the Games were to be staged in Moscow, enemy territory, as far as the American authorities were concerned, during the Cold War. I'm trying to gear down and then gear back up for the Olympics in 1980. Well, maybe there could be a better location, but I'm going to go in and try to make the best of it myself, try to come out with another gold. There was to be no gold, however. The USA decided to boycott the Olympics, and Moses' dreams of glory were dashed. East German Volker Beck constantly and also ran against Moses took gold. Moses' response was simple. Instead of training to win medals, he now trained to run fast. His dedication to hard work was unrivaled. My academic background is in science, so athletics is, was a hobby of mine. I was never really uh, going to be a coach. I wasn't interested in coaching. 
Um, the only person I've ever coached was myself because I did most of the groundwork myself. He was very, very, very careful on his preparations and he lived the sport. Whereas other people coming and went, he, he, was, he was living and breathing it every day. All kinds of running, cross country running, in the grass, at the beach, physical therapy, lifting weights, strong. swimming pool, uh, running on the track. Um, about seven or eight different elements. He came early in the morning and he had his routine and, and he was rigorous and he was always prepared to do the hard work off the track and not everybody was doing, doing that and that, I think that was part of the secret with him as well. Even then he was looking at it in a scientific way, he would wear a heart monitor and he could assess where the hills were and what the pulse rate had gone to so he was um, a very thoughtful racer. The vigorous training regime worked. Moses smashed the world record in the 1976 Olympics and twice more in 77 and 80. He broke it again for a final time in 1983, almost becoming the first man to run under 47 seconds. Even beyond gold medals, our world records are the most important thing uh, because as an athlete you don't run to win medals, you run to better yourself and you run against the clock. If you set a world record, a standard, uh, that no human has ever done before, there's nothing more you can do in your sport except for reset that record. I was able to break the world record on four different occasions, which is a, a very high number for a running event. Hardly anyone does that. So, you know, I ran four world records, which are all great performances, and I ran a couple of uh, track meets in which I probably could have run faster than way faster than I did running any of the records and uh, just didn't on those days. By 1983 he was the holder of the six fastest times in hurdles history. The disappointment of Moscow 1980 was behind him. Moses won the inaugural world championships in August 83. He had revolutionized his event. All of a sudden this person comes along and he changed the whole outlook of the, of the event. I think he was just better than the rest of us and he had that advantage of the strides and the rhythm, but also he was an exceptional athlete, so he could run 47.5, even though he didn't make a perfect race, whereas the rest of us had to run a perfect race to run 47.5. But after World Championship glory and four world records came the next big test. The eight-year wait to win another Olympic gold was nearly over and the 1984 games would be held in Los Angeles, a stone's throw from where he trained. The Olympics in LA was a really big, big event. This time there's much more fanfare. People expect me to win. Uh, my name has been uh, around. I've been getting a lot of publicity for the last three years and building up for the Olympic Games. So I think the expectation is that uh, everyone likes me to win and uh, for me, I have to go out and do it. Well then, uh, Moses was an icon, obviously, because the, not only was he American and the Olympics was in America, but he had that unbeaten streak and uh, he, hadn't, he, he couldn't compete in 1980 because of the boycott. He was not only an icon, but also an elder statesman, now captain of the US Olympic team. Representing the United States Olympic team, Edwin Moses. I think the, the Olympics in LA the build-up and also the platform he had there. And also being from Irvine, he lived next door. Of course, that was, you know, it was, a, it was a great venue for him. In the name of the athletes, I promise that we shall take part in the Olympic Games, respecting and abiding by the rules that govern them. The US captain cruised to wins in his heat and semi-final but now he faced genuine competition in the shape of an American rookie, Danny House. Seeing him that first time, seeing him leave the blocks with, with tremendous amount of power, so much that the blocks rattled. And as an 18-year-old kid, I thought to myself, you know, what, what am I gonna do with that? You know, how do you combat that? He's running his first 200 meters as if there aren't any hurdles there. While the world held its breath for the final, the favourite could not have been more cool. It just mesmerised everybody. Everyone else was frankly getting warmed up. He used to lay down there, listen to his music, chill out. 
So you look at this guy, you know, it's, it's the Olympics soon, son. What, you know, when are you going to get ready? It was just one of those guys who you looked at and you knew was in command of his territory. You know, he had such a flawless start in the games in 84. I looked up at about the fifth hurdle and Edwin was so far out there that I thought to myself, there's no way I'm catching him. When he just kind of relaxed into his stride, he kind of just left the rest of us behind. I felt that if I went out and ran the race that I'm capable of running, I wouldn't have any problems, but it's been a long uphill road and I've been very fortunate not to have any injuries and I just feel very lucky. You got to figure then that this was a guy that could destroy the event if he wanted to. He had an aura about him. It was just like a man who was in the zone, in his moment, and it was effortless. Representing the United States of America, Olympic champion Edwin Moses. I had a good day at the office. Moses had already achieved so much, but his passion remained as strong as ever. He still had his unbeaten run, stretching back to 1977, to protect. What made him unique is that he was able to come back time and again, year after year, and still respect the opposition, even though he was clobbering them in 90% of the cases. Um, and motivate himself to, to go for the next level. Initially, the, the, there wasn't the mystique, I, I think, he gained that when he started to become unbeaten after a few years. And then that became the whole mystique. It became an obsession, I think, with him. For Moses, preparation was always the key. I ran about, competed about 15 minutes a year at the end of the year. That's all it comes out to, and uh, nine, 10 months of training to be able to do that. So the races, you know, for me are, not a really big part of it because everything happens so fast and there's really so small amount of the time versus everything else that you did to prepare. By 1987, he had won 122 races spanning almost a decade. But Olympic silver medalist Danny Harris had been steadily closing the gap. When Danny came on the scene, was a very precocious talent and knew it was only a matter of time when he would win something. I don't think I ever spoke to Edwin uh, in 84. I'm quite sure I didn't speak to him in 84, and that was okay. It was the fact that in the last 36 months, he's the only person that had beaten me, and, uh, and I took it personal, and I wanted to beat him. I needed to figure it out. So every waking moment, every bit of food that I ate, every mile that I ran, every weight that I lifted, Every time I didn't do something that I wanted to do in lieu of going to sleep and getting some rest for the next day, it was all geared towards being the first guy to beat him. That chance would come on June the 4th, 1987, in Madrid. We got on the track and I thought, you know, this is really about to happen. And I felt at the height of my powers and they shot the gun. When we got to 200 meters, I'd never been so close to him before, and I thought, it's really on now. By the time I got to eight, I knew I was going to win. I never forget news break. Edwin Moses loses to Danny Harris. The streak has been broken. I'm going, man. The reason why I didn't throw my hands up when I crossed the finish line when I beat him, it was because I respect him. But I didn't do it because Edwin never did it to us. I told him, you're still a great champion. He said, I know. And that was about it. The end of his great run did not deflate Ed Moses' self-confidence, however. The winning streak is not that important. I think now what's important is for me to run fast times and faster than I've run before. And uh, I know that I can run under 47 seconds. And I think that uh, in the end, I'll be ahead by five to eight meters, no matter what. But going into the 1987 World Championships in Rome, an air of invincibility had gone. The two men who had bookended his unbeaten run, Harold Schmidt and Danny Harris, sensed their chance. 
there was a, a feeling that it could be a, a far tighter race than we were used to. And uh, yeah, and the final showed that. It would be the greatest race of the Ed Moses era. 200 meters, Edwin came uh, past me on the inside, I saw him. And it disturbed me a little bit because when he went past me, he didn't go past me and settle. He went past me and got out there and then he settled. So when he got out there, he was out there about eight, seven or eight meters. You never really know until you finish the 10th hurdle what's going to happen. I had the best spectator seat because I was just five or six meters behind those guys all gone for the line and kind of diving over it and nobody knew, not even I didn't know who, who was the winner. A lot of people say it was the greatest 400 meter hurdle race in history. Harold Smith, Edwin and myself, the photo finish. Three more meters, it would have been mine's, but uh, as it was 400 meters, it was his for that day. Those three were kind of the outstanding ones and over the, that decade and, uh, and that 87 kind of brought everything to a crescendo. It was the narrowest of wins, but a moment of huge pride for Ed Moses. No longer perhaps the force of old, but his talent had inspired those around him. Sometimes you have these world-class leaders who drag everybody else along with them in their vortex. Breaking that sound barrier brought everybody else along a notch or two. After more than a decade in the event, Moses still pursued success. The 1988 Olympics were in Seoul, and Moses, now 33, targeted a third gold medal, 12 years after his first. I think one of his uniquenesses is the length of time he could motivate himself. He just ran and executed. He didn't change his game plan one way. The only thing that probably changed was his turnover, his touchdown time, and his fitness. By 88, though, he was now very much a grandee. Good, but grandee. Lane three, number 1114, Edwin Moses, USA. Despite his age, Moses was favorite for the Olympic final. I was lucky to have an opportunity to race next to him, you know, line up next to him to be a part of, I guess, his history, you know, his, um, his revered history. But history would not be enough. After a blistering start, Moses faded in the final 100 meters. Compatriot Andre Phillips took gold. Moses, for the first time in his career, had to be content with bronze. Edwin finished the race, kind of made an assessment of uh, him not, you know, him placing top three, and, uh, and then he just, he walks off. You know, here's a guy who won two gold medals. You know, he's like, well, you know, I got a bronze. It was not the happy ending he craved. It was time for Edwin Moses to leave track and field. He'd climbed every mountain, and he'd done everything that a person could do in our sport. And that was one of the things I respected him the most about. You know, he did not need to hang around and run a series of 49 second races just to be Edwin Moses. He left, um, not at the height of his powers, but he left it on his own terms. And I thought that that was very important uh, for him and also for his legacy. And I respect him a lot for it. After retiring in 1989, Moses' career was varied. He enjoyed a brief stint with the U.S. bobsleigh team and a career in finance before being elected chairman of the Laureus World Sports Academy in 2000. I think most people look at and expect you to, you know, be a track and field athlete and uh, know more, but I've done lots of, a lot of different things. But it will be on the track where he will be best remembered. Two Olympic gold medals, two world championship golds, four world records, and nearly a decade of unrivaled dominance. Edwin Moses, the greatest hurdler of all time. He broke record after record after record, and it was the dominant force in the event that we all just had to sit back and learn. Edwin was one of those phenomenal athletes that comes along every once in a, a lifetime. Well, the greatness comes, obviously, of being unbeaten for such a long time. You can keep a long streak going if you don't compete against the best, but he never shunned away from, from the best people. I think for just sheer unbelievable consistency and progression, to have someone who could compete for 10 years unbeaten, 122 races I think it was, um, is quite extraordinary. And I think he should be put alongside the Jesse Owens um, in the Hall of Fame 
as someone who was one of the greatest athletes we will see in track and field.